There's no valor more stolen on this earth than that of the Carolingians. Carl and his offensively bickering family are a blight upon the perception of the great Franks. What people can be free when their very family holds them back? When we consider the Frankish people, the dominance of the Carolingian name is a bit of an anachronism. It was not Charlemagne that brought great success to these proto-French people, but the Merovingians. Merovech of the Merovingians was a legendary figure that apparently worked with the Romans to defeat Attila the Hun. Whether that's true or not is irrelevant, given that historically what we know is that his descendants would form the first united Frankish confederation, which would conquer Gaul and found the first Frankish empire. Later on, the Merovingians would weaken due to more and more ambitious lords beneath them and their bickering. After one lord, Pepin the Short became de facto ruler of the realm and appointed his son Charles Martel to be heir, the Merovingians collapsed what would become the Carolingians one generation later. Today, I'm going to take the Merovingians in a different direction. I'll be dropping the legendary Merovech into the world in 867 under the yoke of Carolingian kings so he can deliver justice for his family post hoc. I created Merovech using his representation in CK2. He's considered the founder of a legendary bloodline in that game, and I tried to recreate him here in CK3. I did prioritize creating a character that would be well suited to the role here as the Count of Brabant. He's an Asatru character because back in the Roman days the Franks were still Germanic pagans rather than their Christianized descendants, as well as being Frankish, which is a dead culture in CK3, which will soon be revived. I don't normally play Counts, since they can be a bit slow as a start, but being an Asatru lord under the Lotharingians will give me a pretty accelerated start compared to most Counts. Dropping into the game, Merovech has mostly the same ambitions as his real self. The Franks were more or less a filler for a power vacuum left behind by the Visigoths. In this case, the Franks were making their own power vacuum out of the other Franks. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to refer to my brand of Franks as the Merovingians and the opposing Franks as Carolingians, even though both realms are composed of more than just one family, but let's keep it simple. The first task for the new Count of Brabant is to not get himself killed in a sea of Christians and to build up his wealth to assemble an army. By contributing more levies to the king, Merovech could get a guaranteed council right and become the steward for the realm, and then use the money from that position to get acclaimed on Antwerp to further his own power. After the war, King Lothair's jailers came by to remind Merovech that this was a Christian realm and that he either convert or become a prisoner. Knowing that outright rebellion was asking to have his realm taken from him, he decided to accept jail time. Once he was in jail, Merovech simply broke out of prison, which in the world of CK3 is completely legal. Maybe it was just such an insane gigachad move that the laws of Lotharingia had to adjust to add in an escape clause for their prisons. Upon his return to Leuven, the gigachad count realized he had a son to care for named Robert. Although ugly, Robert was the firstborn, and raising would be important for the future of the dynasty. Although looking to build up his money, Merovech also wanted to keep himself on the king's good side. For that reason, he helped him against one of his brothers in Germany. Lothair was quite happy to receive that aid, even though it was a winning war to begin with. Now Lothair and Merovech get along great, for now. This marked a period of inward growth for Merovech, who basically just built up the domain with his payment to Steward and raised his son. Being at peace for so long left him somewhat bored, but after something like a decade without anything of interest going on, Boredom progressed into ennui and into apathy, culminating into melancholy. That's a nice way of saying that the rising Count of Brabant became depressed. He got some advice from his friends and tried doing more things he enjoys to pull himself out of depression. As difficult as it was, he went to conquer various counts that weren't already conquered around the lowlands. War made him happy, as did winning. The battles had no spirit to them though. What's the point of a war without real opposition? Thanks to his great stewardship, he could hold all the land for himself, and although there was no passion in managing land, it was better than wasting away in bed doing nothing. Looking for more of a challenge, Merovech decided to attack his king. If the king could prove a worthy challenge, it might be just what he needs. Using his allies in Brittany, Merovech was able to, with some difficulty, defeat Lothair and dissolve his realm. Many people saw this as pretty out of left field, but knowing that he was depressed, it made a lot of sense. He was doing whatever he hoped could get him the joy of life back. With freedom from his liege, Merovech declared himself the Duke of Brabant, and he began conquering his once fellow vassals to unite the region. He had no intention of replacing Lothair, but instead he would try to find a new home for his people that he could be proud of. In an impressively short time, he conquered the Lowlands and most of the Rhine territories. Much of Christendom was wary of this pagan gaining traction in a pretty important region of Western Europe, but what could they do? They were too busy fighting each other to fight him. As the Carolingians are wont to do, they focused on killing each other and not the Merovingian under their noses. In 905, Merovich proclaimed a new realm, composed of the Lowlands and his Rhine holdings, which he called Francia, which was not the home of the Western Franks or the Eastern Franks. It was the home of all Franks. This time of explosive Frankish growth slowed down now, as Merovech was hoping this would be enough to pull him out of his depressed state. Unfortunately for him, he was learning the lesson that many others before him had already. You don't ever escape depression, you only learn to live with it. Maybe he was learning though, as Merovech focused on his health and put in effort to keep himself in a good place. He spent more time outside and amongst friends to ward off the monsters growing in him. 
He started to take up the hobby of chess, which was reflected in many of his followers popularizing it even among the locals. Indeed, board games became a staple of Frankish life. After Mirovich adopted it in his own life, it was fun and a pleasant distraction from the slog of life. Eventually, the need for conquest called the Mirovich again, and he went to war with the West Franks, as they call themselves, to take Flanders. The Carolingians spoke some kind of strange Latin, not any kind of Frankish that the true Franks spoke. This meant Merovich felt no fraternity with his Christianized and Latinized kinsmen neighbors. They also didn't play chess. There really was no redemption for them. As part of his desire for new lands to spice up his regular walks, West Francia simply had to fall. Further beyond that, he wanted to be fair to his children, who would need realms to split between them. Although the Carolingians were welcomed by their heirs splitting land, Merovich would ensure that his children wouldn't fight by giving them fair land distributions and teaching them to care for each other. Surely his children would understand those lessons and work together to preserve the family unity. Only a Carolingian would backstab their brother. The Merovingians were better than that. It was a given that the Carolingian king stood no chance against superior Merovingian strategies. After all, if he can't play chess, how can he lead an army? With new land came new vassals, and although it was a possibility to just revoke all their land, Merovich felt it important to let local power holders remain in charge. He wasn't a particularly zealous believer in the old gods, and he wasn't looking to pick fights with Christians. They were simply who was around. As part of the movie into the Seine River Valley, the new Frankish capital became Paris, and the Valois Duchy was divided amongst his children. They'd want even further spoils during succession, but at least some land would satiate them for now. Despite his best efforts to tolerate the Christians, they seemed intent on overthrowing him. So as quickly as Merovich took France, he had to fight to keep it. This war was not something as simple as his previous conquests. The various lords stacked against him were quite powerful, and although Merovich would win in the end, his opponents certainly didn't make it easy. As part of the punishment for their uprising, most people were expecting mass revocations or executions, but he only asked the lords renounce God in favor of the old gods. Merovich had to do something to show that he couldn't be crossed, but he had no desire to create any enemies. For now, the vassals were dealt with, but then came the commoners. These foes would prove much easier, given their leaderless rebellion had no sense of cohesion. They were just impoverished peasants with pitchforks. Nothing to fear here. As one last conquest, Merovich went after his old allies in Brittany. This was mostly because Brittany was a region that he could give out to one of his sons as a way to amicably split the realm. Despite its small size, Brittany was in fact its own legal kingdom, and thus its ruler could call himself a king. Despite Merovich's promise to give out land equally to his sons, it seems he was already pragmatically finding the way to give each son the bare minimum. Maybe the Carolingians were right to split their kingdoms how they did. In 935, Merovich finally passed away, living a long, satisfying, and successful life. He would go down in Frankish history as the legendary Merovingian founder, and he left Francia to his oldest son, Robert. Robert was already 65, so his realm wasn't likely to last long, but let's see what this geezer can pull off in the years he has left. Robert was quite the old man, and his brothers ruled the new conquests. In some ways, he'd have preferred to rule some of that new land in West Francia, but he was happy to save his father's land in Brabant too. But he was happy to have his father's land in Brabant too. His younger brother, Chilperich, was the ruler of West Francia, and he wasn't a half-bad ruler himself. Although lacking the wisdom of old age that Robert had, Chilperich was a respectable king. His other brother, Frotari, ruled over Brittany and Utrecht, and was a zealot for the old gods, who was a berserker and studied the old tales with his free time. It was impressive how well the realms split, and how each kid had a reasonably sized and reasonably powerful realm. The weakest of the realms was Frotari's kingdom in Brittany, which was mostly due to its diminutive size. Being as old as Robert, funnily enough, one of his first actions as king was to sort out his succession. He had to pick between his sons, Ramnolf, Merovich, Volvari, and Zigobald. All of them were relatively competent, but Robert chose his youngest, Zigobald, with the hope that he'd grow to be better than any of his brothers under the close guidance of a king. By eight years old, Zigobald was already about as skilled as most of his siblings in the art of war, although he was rather ugly. With his age catching up to him pretty much right upon his coronation, Robert died at the age of 69. Nice. After ruling for just four years. That much was really expected of him, although he'd go down in the Merovingian Chronicles as the Old Merovingian. The realm passed from Robert to Zigobald, who was a bit young for the position. Without his father to guide him, Zigobald looked to his mother, Mare, for guidance. She wasn't a ruler like his father, but she was intelligent and trustworthy. To start off his reign, Zigobald was bold. He went on a raiding campaign in his uncle Chilperich's realm in France. That bold opening was met with a challenge from his vassals in the form of a liberty war for autonomous vassals. Being the bold boy he was, Zigobald met them in the field. Much like his grandfather, Zigobald played lots of chess from a young age, and he was ready to use those skills. From the young age of 10, Zigobald came up with the strategies for his commanders to use against their rebellious vassals. Where most commanders would have ignored a child's advice, they considered his ideas and found them to have merit. Without formal experience in the field, Zigobald was developing something of a detachment from war. Most people believed he wasn't aware that war was even a place where people died. Nor did he really know what death was, although Zigobald denied his rumored ignorance with some petulance. Needless to say, the Liberty War was put down with ease, although there were some downsides to the internal strife. 
In response to the raid in Flanders, Chilperich led a raiding party into Bologna against Siegebald. As quickly as Liberty Faction was put down, the army was back up again to defend the borderlands. Although Siegebald defeated Chilperich's army, he wasn't done. He went back into his own family's territory and burned it down. Cycle of revenge was already forming, and family bonds were being broken within just two generations of legendary founder. That is, two generations if we even count Robert's four-year rulership. These early wars shaped Siegebald pretty heavily as he came out of those wars with a sense of ambition and caution. He was a direct, upfront, and reserved person. He's hard to read, but willing to take anyone down who gets in his way. Siegebald seemed like he'd bring about another revolutionary period for the Merovingians. The question was how he'd treat his uncles, who were more and more looking like they'd be defeated by their nephew. At 16 years old, Siegebald became a man and was a well-respected commander. He had to accomplish a lot to live up to his grandfather's reputation. He started by removing his uncle from the throne of France. Wanting to get a taste of the battlefield, Siegebald led his armies personally, and it was an interesting experience for him. He was finally seeing what his chess pieces were doing when he moved them, and it was a sobering experience. War was brutal. During his campaign, he had his first son, Arnulf. He was quite the young father, but to imagine that every one of those soldiers were once a child just like his own was a little harrowing. For now, he'd put that aside, but it would always hold some space in the back of his head. The campaign against Chopric was a long one, going on for years, as the family members fought and raided each other. Eventually, France had its own civil war during the invasion, and that was the nail in the coffin for Chopric's efforts to maintain his empire. At 21 years of age, the five-year-long reclamation of France was over, and Chopric maintained his domain along the Seine, albeit paying homage to his nephew, Siegebald. How embarrassing. Unfortunately, while playing with his peers, Arnulf was killed in an accident, leaving his sibling, Robert, to be the heir. Maybe this Robert would be a better ruler than Siegebald's father. The stress of losing his son distracted Siegebald from managing the realm effectively, and before long, the subjects of France rose up to put a dreaded Carolingian on the throne. That was absolutely intolerable, but looking at the numbers, the Carolingian Louis had quite the support. Simultaneously, the Catholics of the realm rose up in rebellion against the realm itself. The Catholics were a more existential threat, and as such, Siegebald focused on them. He was able to put them down with a relatively low effort, given their lacking army quality, but in the time spent on that war, the Carolingian rebellion was ravaging the countryside. The war was dire, but Siegebald would make one last effort to turn it around. With one last battle in Paris, Siegebald's chess skills couldn't save him, as it was a clearly losing battle. The king and the rebel lords met in the heart of Paris and signed a treaty signing over France to the Carolingians. France was in the hands of Louis IV, who by his very cognomen, was a fool. At the very least, this king believed in the old gods, although how long he'd last in the Sea of Catholics was a great question. This was certainly not the end for Siegebald's ambitions, as he knew that France was only temporarily out of his reach. He turned his attention to some of his vassal conquests out in the new realm of England. A long time ago, in Merovich's time, one of the Frankish lords invaded Dover to establish a Frankish foothold on the island. Since then, the entirety of Kent and even Cornwall had fallen. If Siegebald couldn't take France, maybe he could establish himself off in England. He locked Wessex in his sights and went for it. It was perhaps the case that Siegebald's mind was still clouded by the horrors of the war he had seen in his youth, and in combination with the loss of his son, he once again underestimated his opponent. The petty king of Wessex was able to call on a Catholic holy order and mercenaries of his own to utterly crush the Franks with superior numbers and quality. No amount of intelligent tactics can defeat a simply superior army. With one extremely one-sided battle and a clear losing war, Siegebald surrendered and paid the Wessex king out with gold he simply didn't have. If that wasn't enough, the Catholics smelled weakness and declared a crusade for Cologne. Although the Frankish realm was only slightly embedded in the former kingdom of Lotharingia, another loss would have humiliating consequences. Three lost wars in a row would not be a reputation that Siegebald could recover from, so he'd have to show them that he really was worthy to rule the Franks with this crusade. Yet somehow the humiliation was already setting in. He'd lost France to his rival family. He'd lost to a petty king in uncivilized Britannia, and he was about to be defeated by a bunch of pacifist Christians. It was a little too much to take. But from July of 1958 onward, Siegebald was forever changed. He became obsessed with the horrors of war and became a little twitchy. Funnily enough, his insanity, in some way, made him a better commander, as opponents could no longer predict him. The once calm, professional general with a chess background was turning into a wild, unpredictable force of nature in war, and as his tactics evolved, the crusade was upon the Franks. Things looked dire, but the ever-infighting Catholics were unable to unite into one army, and using his massive coalition army of Germanics, Siegebald trounced every single invading army in several locations. This was exactly the series of wins he needed to prove himself to more than just the Franks, but to the entirety of Europe. From there, with renewed confidence, Siegebald sought to reclaim France from his rival, but this time he'd do it piece by piece. He'd have to uproot most of the long-standing lords, and that would mean weakening it from the outside. He first declared a war to take Valois, and most importantly, the city Paris. The war was tough at first, with the Carolingians putting up quite the fight. It turned out that Louis the Foolish was a little wiser than it seemed. Maybe it was his age, but he was able to match Siegebald's outlandish tactics. 
Knowing that a loss to the Carolingians would be intolerable, he arranged a betrothal between his son, Robert, and one of the daughters of the King of Denmark to secure an alliance that he could use to defeat France. After the Danes came in, the tide of war swung in Sigebald's favour, and he defeated Louis, claiming the rich values of Valois for himself. In order to assert himself as the Lord of France, Sigebald took a step further. Like his grandfather, he moved the Rome capital to Paris, and even further beyond that, abandoned his home in Brabant, leaving it to his sons. He took Valois as his new domain, as a sign that he was there to stay. Due to recent adversity between the old gods and the new god, the Franks were starting to abandon Merovich's more pragmatic approach to religion. It said the Franks became ardently religious, and adopted the strong believers' cultural tradition. It seemed that the Franks would be further rejecting Christianity. After some time acclimating to his new capital, Sigebald noticed that across the border, the French were scrambling to avoid further conflict, and as part of the fear that they would have been supplanted by the Merovingians, put up a puppet queen in Louis's place. He was deposed and replaced with one of Sigebald's cousins, Hildesendis. The hope was to ward off an invasion by making this a family issue, but Sigebald didn't really care. After all, this cousin of his was no Frank. She was a Frenchie, and she even created her own house, firmly separating her from the Merovingian family. Why would he treat her any different than that fool Louis? Indeed, with that mentality, he declared a war to reclaim France. In a war that lasted only two years, the puppet queen quickly crumbled, and Sigebald once again sat on the French throne, with his capital already located in Paris. This conquest was different though. Sigebald was not conquering France and bearing his glory for himself. No, it seemed his lunatic mania had developed into some kind of narcissism, as he changed France into a new realm, a realm called Sigebaldland. This new realm was centered on the accomplishments of Sigebald, who had defeated Christendom and emboldened his people to stand against their Carolingian usurpers. As part of his narcissism, Sigebald got revenge against the petty Wessex king, and this time would not lose. In fact, Sigebald promised to never lose a war again. He had mostly given up chess by this point in his life, preferring the game of real life. What had once harrowed him as a young man became sport. Lives before him were nothing more than pieces on the board. He wasn't a cruel or sadistic person. He was like a child that saw these wars as shows in some way. They were entertainment. In some ways, it may have even been art. Art is, after all, in the eye of the beholder, and the creativity of the now childlike Sigebald was without limit. Of course, the unfettered rulership of Sigebald would be questioned by local lords within what was once France. Did they stand a chance? Almost certainly not, especially with Denmark willing to back up the Merovingian hegemony over the region. Unlike previous Merovingians, Sigebald was not so kind to let these lords rule their ancestral homes. Instead, he revoked them, and replaced them with lords loyal to him. This was the punishment for losing the game, and although they kept their lives, they lost their livelihoods. Was there much of a difference, really? At this point, Sigebaldland was becoming the nascent force of Europe, and was only rivaled by the Italian Empire, also ruled by Carolingians, to the south. Such an insult to his pride simply couldn't be allowed to exist, and as such, Sigebald declared an invasion of Burgundy. The Burgundians were once a proud Germanic tribe, not all that different from the Franks, who had also invaded Gaul. That reputation had to be redeemed. Such redemption can only be found through Sigebald, who will lead the Burgundian name to glory. At least in theory, anyway. What would likely happen is that Burgundy would just become another territory of the Merovingians, which would promptly be rebranded into a Frankish territory. But only time will tell. The Italians were surprisingly weak, perhaps because they had not faced any difficulty in their realm. The Carolingians were simply handed everything they had, whereas the proud Merovingians had to fight for it. That's the difference that true struggle really makes. Alongside Burgundy, Sigebald was able to occupy parts of western Lotharingia and add them to his growing realm. It seemed that this conquest would be his last, as soon afterwards, Sigebald's age finally caught up with him. It was a bit unexpected, as he had spent his whole life in good health, but in many ways, age takes its time creeping up on its targets. It had no mercy for Sigebald, despite his, seemingly, deific status. He left Burgundy and Sigebald land to his son, Robert, and left Francia to Berold and Brittany to his eponymous son, Sigebald. The idea was to give the son named after himself a small realm to build from, with the idea that he might emulate Sigebald's own exploits. Either way, it's time to focus on Robert II, who was much younger than his predecessor. While certainly a man in the prime of his adulthood, he was no old man, nor child. Most people were simply happy to see the lunatic Sigebald pass away without much at conflict. Robert of the Merovingians is an interesting man, in that he is entirely unlike his ancestors. He is a patient, content, and compassionate man. He doesn't have a warlike bone in his body, and he's a diplomat. He spends money as he sees fit. Would the Merovingians collapse under their new king? They'd already splintered in a way, with the Frankish homelands around the Rhine and Brittany being handed out to Robert's siblings. Would the content king even bother to take it all back? The first issue Robert faced as a king, at this point, was a tradition for the Merovingians, as the lords of the realm wished to replace him with a pretender. He'd have to go through the same trial by fire as his ancestors and prove himself a worthy king on the battlefield. He was able to put down the rebellion through relatively normal tactics and simply outnumbered his opponents, alongside having superior men at arms. Any of the Catholic lords that rose up had their land revoked, and other vassals would be either executed or ransomed back. Outside of these initial rebellions, Robert kept the realm peaceful. For him, it was important to let the realm prosper and grow under him. 
It was time to settle down from war and build up the land for the future. This is what made Robert a controversial figure among his peers. He was not a warlike king. He did not seek war, nor did he seek conflict. He did not like to spill blood, for some said he was even a little squeamish. Despite his personality, it seemed war was coming to him though, as the Pope declared a crusade for England. Although his brother Berold was the one who had land in England, the die had been cast. It was clear that no amount of peaceful intentions could ward off the warlike spirits of the Latins. At first, Robert kept out of the war, thinking that he had no desire to get involved. He trusted that his brother could hold off the Christians. However, upon being accused of cowardice by his family and realm, he did join his brother in war to protect England from Christian aggression. By the time he joined, it had seemed that the Christians were mostly already routed. The battles were huge, and blood soaked the soil of southern England. The war seemed in a flux, as between battles, huge swings in momentum changed to his ahead within minute times. At times, all felt lost, while one battle later the enthusiasm was back. Eventually, with Robert's help, it was the old gods who won out, and once again the Christian world was defeated by a Merovingian king, or in this case, Merovingian kings. This was a symbolic moment. The brothers had worked together, and as such formed an amicable relationship, and for that, Robert changed his realm's name from Ziegabaldland, a somewhat unfitting name, over to something everyone could agree was deserved, Merovingia. Entering his 50s, it seemed that Robert was going to be a relatively boring king in regards to the realm, but a hugely unifying force for his family. Rather than simply reconquer his brother's kingdoms, he'd coexist with them. Was that because he lacked ambition? Maybe. But no matter the reason, these brothers got along better than any care religion ever could. Looking at his own succession, Robert had actually been blessed to only have one son, Bernard, who would simply inherit the entire realm. There was no succession to worry about, although he was disappointed that Bernard was not a particularly well-suited ruler. That would be up to him to figure out though, as Robert didn't feel the need to shape up his son. What he did do though was probably his most controversial choice as a ruler. In 1010 AD, Robert made the decision to split his realm away from its roots. He wanted peace, and the realm wanted peace. He was a compassionate man who didn't want to fight people, yet every half decade he had to put down the radical Christians of his realm. These rebellions were causing needless bloodshed, and there was no way to stop them besides either their conversion, which would take some centuries to do, or his conversion. Robert decided that Christianity was the path of peace for his realm, even after having just fought off a Christian crusade. The realm, out of respect for Robert's prosperous rule, accepted the conversion, and suddenly Merovingia was a Christian realm, joining the world of Rome. For this, Robert was labeled a traitor by the rest of the Frankish world. Were the Merovingians going down the same path as their rival Carolingians? Would they simply Christianize, Latinize, and lose their heritage? As far as his brothers were concerned, this was an eyebrow-raising move. But how could Berold be upset when Robert had saved his English holdings from Christian seizure? Maybe Robert was just doing what he felt was necessary, and still kept the old gods in his heart. Either way, the future of Merovingia is in the balance, as Robert has many routes he can take. As Robert has many routes he can take Merovingia down, and whether or not he'll tolerate his heathen brothers is an issue that will ripple consequences for centuries. No matter what Robert does, it is assured that the story of the Merovingian family is not over, and where this dynasty goes will be a story for another video. The Merovingians are the first unifiers of the Franks, oft forgotten, and replaced by the more famous Charlemagne and his Carolingian descendants. Today, Carl, Carlos, Charles, Carol, and Charlie are common names. But there could have been a world where Mero, Meroves, Marov, and Merovi could have been the names all pointing back to Merovich. Whether or not that happens, at least in this one virtual world, is in the hands of the Merovingian family. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for your time.